so we, we, when we're talking about maxillary entrostomy, um, I actually really like extended maxillary surgeries. And so um, when I get the choice from Greg about what to talk about, uh, I like frontal sinus stuff, ethmoy, all that stuff. Yeah, I, I love chronic sinus disease management. I love tumors. But, but really, like the basic maxillary entrostomy and extended maxillary sinus uh, surgery has really uh, been something I've, I've done some different work on in trying to improve recalcitrant max maxillary sinusitis. And, and I'm going to show you some of those techniques today. Um, and it's just some basic stuff. So I do want to acknowledge research support. Um, this, I, I show you these pictures because this, uh, this is my partner, Jess Grayson, and this is Dr. Cho, um, two of the greatest partners uh, you could possibly have, incredibly loyal. Uh, we work together like peas and carrots. We're, we're very, very uh, close. Um, one of the best parts about academics is, is really enjoying and um, getting up to work and going to work and enjoying work, then you don't work a day in your life, right? So um, absolutely great to have collegial interaction um, so max ray sinus, the way that I think about a step ladder in max ray sinus surgery is you, you have like conservative down here all the way up to like the old fashioned Caldwell Lux obliteration, that kind of thing. In between are these step ladder of, of holes that you can make, right? So there's way, different ways you can think about this. So the first thing is, you know, you think about plumbing, right? So, so plumbing is a problem of drainage. It's a problem of um, recirculation. It's a problem of, of the ability for the sinus to clear itself. Um, the second thing you talk about is access. And so access is really important when you have inflammatory disease, recalcitrant infectious disease, the stuff that's very difficult to clear, right? So that's where topical strategies really come into play, right? So heavy topical steroids, topical antibiotics, and whatnot. And when I think about the max ray sinus for drainage procedures, and this is inflammatory, right? So we'll talk about a couple alternative procedures you can do for tumor. But, but when you're looking up here in, in the access, you really want a big hole because you want access to that sinus, be able to clean it, be able to deliver topical antibiotics and topical st uh, steroids in certain situations. Um, and then you, you start to talk about even bigger holes. And, and this is that realm where you talk about mega, mega, antrosty, mega antrostomy and the modified endoscopic meal maxillectomy. People will say, like, oh, well, you know, they're the same thing or whatnot. But really, the modified is a little bit of an extended version of a mega antrostomy. Um, and, and so when we look at the lateral wall of the max ray sinus, you know, you have the small hole, which is essentially removing the unsinted process, exposing that natural ostia. Uh, hopefully you don't have a posterior font now because this actually can set up a, a situation where you have recirculation, and we'll show that in a second. But um, when we're talking about access, of course, we want to go big hole. And so this is kind of your standard maxillary entrostomy. You know, we haven't bit into the inferior turbinate. We've got that nice oval shape um, back to the... Uh, maxillary ridge back here, and we've got exposure of the posterior wall in, and the roof. Um, so the roof exposure is really helpful when you're doing ethmoid surgery, for example, going back to the sphenoid. If you can identify the the, the superior maxillary um, roof, then you have a really good projection to uh, stay low and, and stay away from the skull base. Recirculation is, is one of those classic plumbing things, right? So here we've got a nice big uh, hole here, so this is a good access hole, but you know they they actually haven't connected up from the natural ostia to the the max ray sinus the entrostomy. So this is a surgically made entrostomy that hasn't connected up with the natural hole. This is a classic situation that we see. Um, someone says, "Oh yeah, I've got dumping that comes down the back of my throat." you know, a couple times a day. It's really annoying. I'll feel like this pull, and then I'll have a big glob of mucus that comes down. And this is really because all the mucus in the sinus comes out of the natural hole. And then if you have a, a band here, it accumulates until gravity, it gets heavy enough that it pulls against gravity and dumps down the back of the throat. So really simple things um, to, to, to watch out for and make sure that you're connected up to the natural ostia. Another thing about plumbing problems, um, I'm going to present this case as a 40-year-old male with gradual onset of right-sided anaphthalmus over one month, mild right facial pressure. He had a right fest by a local ENT. Um, the right-sided anaphthalmus should clue you into on something called silent sinus, right? So silent sinus where you have an imploded uh, max ray sinus. Um, 
And you know, the, the, the ENT actually did a nice job of staying away from the eye, right? So that's the thing about when you have an imploded sinus. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, so you have this right max ray sinus, which is small, left max ray sinus here, dropped orbit. And you can see you've got that atelectatic infundibulum um, where you've got an uncinate process stuck to the orbit. So does everyone here pretty much use Parsons technique, you know, like with the back, with the uh, ball tip probe to pull the uncinate away? Yeah, that, that technique to me is by far the safest. And one of the things is being in academics and teaching residents, I always want to make sure my residents are incredibly safe. And so that's the number one thing I always preach is you, you always want to be very careful around the eye, around the skull base. Um, when we use the Parsons technique, we're pulling the uncinate away from the eye. And in this situation, why this guy continues to have problems is because all the mucus comes up into this region because that's where the natural osse is and it's still sealed up. Uh, however, he's made a posterior hole right back here um, because he stayed away from the eye. But now the patient has a lot of drainage and, and difficulty. And so really the concept here, see that posterior hole right here? They've actually stayed safe, but we, he hasn't removed the uncinate. And so removing the uncinate, the classic technique, uh, this is a very old video, but um, pulling the uncinate away from the eye really helps stay safe in that scenario. And um, we use a 90 degree Blake sleeve, sometimes a, a kerosene up just to kind of uh, remove that area. And, and then the backbiter around the corner, this really helps kind of connect those areas. And in this scenario, this is a pure plumbing problem, right? This patient doesn't have like systemic inflammatory disease. As if you get this thing uh, taken care of, it's taken care of. They don't need like a, excessive medication and, and chronic uh, topical steroids and whatnot. This was a, uh, purely a plumbing problem. So, you know, moving on to the, you know, you've got the small hole, the big hole. When you talk about the modified endoscopic meal maxillectomy, you know, this is a, a procedure I, I do a lot, but, but remember my practice is academic. I do tons of revisions, tons of recalcitrant max ray sinus, sinusitis, um, situations where people have prior call of lux, orbital, um, orbital procedures where the fat herniates into the infundibulum. So these are the situations that I'm, I'm dealing with. And, and so from my standpoint, I love the modified because it's a, it's a really good access procedure. Remember, access is really the key in this scenario. And you, get, you can get access to the front wall, the back wall, the, the floor, and really provide um, excellent cleaning and clinic and delivery of topical therapeutics. This shows the, the standard uh, hole that we do. We actually extend this uh, to the, the front anterior wall down here. If you look at the description of the mega antrostomy, which, funny enough, was actually um, first described by Dr. Cho, my partner, when he was at Stanford with Peter Wong. Um, and I got to describe the modified endoscopic amino maxillectomy for the first time because I was a resident with Raj Schlosser. And so um, we, we described this first, and then the next year they described the mega antrostomy. But really what it is is you're extending underneath this region right here, doing a little bit more aggressive turbinate resection, but always leaving this head of the turbinate. This um, gets those empty nose critics uh, um, it, it, it calms those empty nose critics down. And honestly, you know, when you leave that head of the, the inferior turbinate, you really don't have any problems. Um, indications for this, obviously tumor. Cystic fibrosis is really where I first described a really regimented approach to, to using this technique. Orbital fat and infundibulum, previous cobalt luck where you have a contracted sinus. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the dysfunctional max ray sinus, which is really kind of one of the areas of uh, research that I, I focus on. Um, thing about a modified, it makes a gravity-dependent sinus. It improves the access for the debridement, like we said, and really that application of topical treatments. And people with cystic fibrosis, when they're later on, you know, they've got a lung function of 30, um, you can actually clean these sinuses really well uh, under just a little bit of local or, or topical and, and not really worry about having to go to uh, future general anesthesia. So CF patients, kind of standard, they have smaller sinuses, they, they, they're a little hypoplastic. The floor is often either above or at the level of the, the nasal cavity. It's the classic look for a CF patient who's had extensive sinus surgery, but then fills up with pus immediately. And so the concept here is basically removing that um, turbinate, and then we raise this mealy based uh, nasal mucosal floor flap. Um, and, and, and so this goes up to the inferior meatus, and it covers the exposed bone when you're done, so it's, it's really good for healing. 
I'm going to show you a different technique where we actually extend that and, and the concept behind that. But, but what we're seeing here is a very small sinus that's trapped mucosa. Um, it, the, the cystic fibrosis, they tend to have those little loculated pockets. Uh, and this is before trikafta, by the way. So we could get a result like this before trikafta because we've got really good access. They're not accumulating. We can uh, deliver topical antibiotics and steroids and whatnot to the cavity. And we can have a look right through the mid portion, portion of the uh, max, ray and, max ray sinus and see that we've got excellent exposure. We can clean them every three months and then it's essentially kind of resetting their system. Now, what about um, the scenario where you know you have a dysfunctional sinus, or, or a, you know, I, I, this is a technique what I call an extended flap, and uh, this is a, a newer concept. And the idea is basically what we call a maxillary mucosal replacement. And when you have a dysfunctional sinus, um, what's interesting about the max ray sinus is, is usually the nasal floor and the inside of the nasal cavity is fine. Usually nice and clean, no problems. Um, and so the concept here is to actually, because the, the pus accumulates at the bottom of the sinus, is to deliver nice, healthy skin to the bottom of the sinus. And so this is an extended flap technique that that I, uh, I do in some, uh, certain situations. And the concept here, and this is a, a newer video, we use a needle tip bovi cautery nowadays, is we, we incorporate the, the lateral aspect of the inferior turbinate mucosa. Again, a nice extended flap. This is going to be nice and long, and we're able to replace a lot of the inferior mucosa within the, the sinus itself. So extend that flap. We put it up against the septum like so, and then we do essentially a vertical ant uh, antrostomy or, or osteotomy in the, in the lateral wall. And uh, I use a backbiter to come back to the anterior max ray wall. We stay out of the region of the Hazner's valve, which is up here. And what you see is uh, looking around the corner with a 70 degree scope, we can drill the inferior max ray ridge, get it nice and flat. Um, and then I, essentially what I do is I remove the inferior floor mucosa because, again, what, in this scenario, what we're trying to do is introduce nice, healthy tissue to the bottom of the sinus, and, uh, and that's going to have less pooling um, in my hands than, than otherwise. And so that, that flap basically essentially replaces all that skin at the bottom of the sinus. And so what that allows you to do, and this is kind of what it looks like uh, for this first post-op visit, I like to kind of show... Whoop. Oh, boy. My first problem with the video. Okay. Well, we have other ones we can look at. Um, so the concept is this, this uh, flap comes over, replaces that skin. I have another example of this later, so I can show you that. Um, let's move on to kind of other access issues. So this is going to be... So, so you don't really need to do anything beyond a modified endoscopic myomax like when it comes to chronic inflammatory disease, chronic infectious disease, in my opinion. Uh, we have all... The, the technique of that is essentially an end-stage procedure. It's kind of like a draft three. Um, technically, you could do like a call well, like obliteration type procedure if, if you absolutely needed to, but, the, but obviously it's something we, we prefer not to do. When it talks about tumor, though, uh, you know, this is a different scenario because what you're trying to do is gain access to where the pedicle is. Under normal circumstances, with uh, angled scopes, you can get into the, the posterior uh, max ray wall, the inferior floor, uh, some of the lateral, but, the, but really this space in the pre-lacrimal area right here behind the, the lacrimal duct is an area that's very difficult to access. Um, the, other, the option you can do is actually remove the nasal lacrimal duct to the, to the, uh, to the nasal max ray buttress. There are a number of techniques described for this, and you know I don't like a dankers or modified dankers because they can get some dimpling, and that's basically where they remove the buttress of the uh, nasomaxillary buttress, and that basically gives them uh, direct access to this region. My preference is actually to use angled scopes to get around the corner. If it's in this space right here, I do a modified, but then I can do a uh, basically what I call a pre-maxillary approach, which is I'll well, show in a second. Um, this is the modified for a tumor, and so in this scenario, same same exact thing as you saw earlier. We're taking that middle, the inferior turbinate off, raising a flap, doing a a, a, a vertical osteotomy. This provides that access, and this is a posterior laterally based tumor, so very easy to access and take out of the nose. And so, once you've taken this out, take margins, and then. Um, drill the pedicle, 
but I want to show you the flap at the end. So here's a flap coming in. This is a smaller flap. This is the old style to essentially cover that exposed bone so that you have good healing. Um, one of the other tricks for kind of gaining access to the anterior maxillary wall is the transeptal approach. And that's essentially where you're looking for um, access to that anterior wall. And the transeptal approach is nice because when you have these anterior lesions right here, uh, you can keep the buttress intact, go through the transept, go through the septum by raising a flap on one side, doing a cartilage mucoperiosteal window. Uh, once you've done your modified, you get gain access to that anterior maxillary sinus, and you can drill that tumor pedicle, get answers to that area. Um, we, we found endoscopic DCRs obviously were, were more common in this scenario because it gives you that extra approach. But again, the buttress is intact, so you don't have problems with that. Uh, and there was really no call well, we did no call well look approaches for these anterior maxillary or anterior lateral maxillary sinus inverted papillomas. And you can see the exposure you can get here to the front wall um, on this uh, image guidance picture. So it's a really nice technique to gain access to that area. I know a lot of people like to do the pre lacrimal approach, which is essentially taking the the nasolacrimal duct out of its housing and then essentially putting it back. My opinion on that is I like to do a modified, I like to have exposure so I could do surveillance. Um, here is a, a classic example of a little bilateral inverted papillomas, but we looked on the left side and, and took a biopsy of this anterior one and came back as papilloma. This is a pre-maxillary approach, essentially taking keeping the housing of the, the duct intact at the buttress and then essentially having the partner um, elevate laterally, and you stay medial to the anterior superior alveolar nerve, you gain access to the anterior wall and the prelacrimal space really well. And this is a really nice alternative technique to, um, again, with that, that classic prelacrimal approach or trying to do a Denkers or something like that. So this is a technique that you can practice in the lab. It's very, very simple. Uh, you just basically retract the treak. It's almost like an endoscopic call well lock. There's no incisions, of course. In that buttress uh, area, you can put that mucosa back together really nice with a stitch. So the final little area I want to talk about is a dysfunctional max ray sinus. And again, this is really about restoring normal function to the sinus, right? So is, and it, it comes down to enhanced surgical access, oxygenation, control of the inflammation, bacterial infection, and biofilms. Um, patient compliance is super critical in this. I mean, I, I see here people all the time like, oh yeah, you know, so-and-so, you know, I did a, I did a, Max ray wall takedown procedure, and they continue to cross and have problems, whatever. And I, I do, I do wonder, like, you know, are they being really aggressive about, you know, doing culture direct antibiotics, um, trying to restore everything to normal, or are they just kind of going about their day? They get patients get frustrated. They stop doing rinses and whatnot. Um, it's really important to continue that patient compliance, and then of course the extended flaps is the the other thing we talked about. So. Uh, this is a cl classic, this is another example. This is a really extended flap. So this is a foreign bodies in the sinus are really, they can be a little bit of a pain because if you have sinus lift procedures or you have dental implants, these are expensive procedures. And, um, you know, the problem is, is when you develop severe infection, when you've got exposed hydroxy appetite in the sinus, it's just not going to clear. And so in this scenario, it's a great idea to use that extended flap approach to drill these down and, and really um, cover that area. I've saved a couple implants this way, by the way. Um, and, and if there's one thing that patients want is they want to save their implants because they're $20,000 a lot of time you know, with these dental implants. Really nice, big, extended flap um, for sake of time. I'll, uh, but see, this is the hydroxyapatite, and she had infection all caught around the corner. And, and so we're going to drill this down, remove all the mucosa around it. See that this infection caught around the corner? So we drill all this down, and then we place this flap over. And you can see uh, this, this actually really restores the, the function to the bottom of the sinus. And just to kind of show you what that looks like, uh, this is at six weeks, and, and she's really, really healthy flap down here. A little bit of necrosis at the tip, but, but doing really well. Um, I'm going to fast forward here just for the sake of time because we have a minute left and I like to plug some basic science. So um, one of the, again, one of the areas of my research is the, the dysfunctional sinus and 
topical antibiotic strategies, even though people say in all the literature, like, oh, yeah, well, there's no evidence that it helps and, and whatnot. The bottom line is, though, we all do it. When <laughs> We all do it when they have these severe uh, chronic bacterial biofilms and, and crusting and stuff, and we see it works clinically. Um, problem is we don't really have good randomized controlled trials looking at it, and it's always a problem when you're looking at uh, drugs and um, investigational new drug applications with the FDA. But you know, one of the things we look at in the lab is, is the antibiotic eluding stent. We've developed a superfloxacin coated sinus stent, and in this scenario, what we're doing is using a rabbit model of Pseudomonas, and we place a single layer coating stent originally. And what happened was um, we had this burst release. Uh, it was pretty effective, but you know, most of the drug is released within the first couple of days. And so what we did decide to do is actually add Ivacaftor, which is a hydrophobic stent that, that kind of delays the release of ciprofloxacin. This dual layer of coating was, allows it to release over a couple of weeks. And, and so we, we see massive reduction in, in PA01, which is a laboratory strain of Pseudomonas um, biofilms. And, and this technique, we think, is going to be the future for the dysfunctional sinus, uh, just to kind of show you that. And to stay on time, I am done. And I will take any questions that you have regarding this, and we'll show the technique of the modified endoscopic meal maxillectomy in the, in the, uh, the lab. Any questions? Okay, yes. In terms of chronic disease, how is the biologics modified? Practice. Oh, the biologics. Um, yeah, so inflammatory disease is, is a big deal. But what I think we're finding with the, the biologics, and I don't know if anyone else has seen this, is you almost get like a conversion in some of these patients from a TH2 to a TH1 phenotype where um, if they started, say, we all see pseudomonas in these polyp patients, right, for example, and those can be really difficult because even though if you're using biologic, you can still be left with this chronic crusting and pseudomonas and, and whatnot. And the one thing about pseudomonas, is just, it's just difficult to clear, and you get those mucoid um, biofilm type uh, forming organisms, they stick to the surface and are very difficult to, to manage. But we do use chronic antibiotics, topical antibiotics, and, and we can clear these quite a bit um, using these techniques that I showed. So, yeah. Appreciate the question on uh, biologics. We'll have a good panel about that tomorrow and dive in pretty deep.